Okay, so in this study, I just wanted to take a bit of time to look at the parable of Matthew 22. Matthew 22 is the parable of the wedding garment. And um, we're going to seek to understand what this parable is teaching. First looking at the natural and then making deductions about the, the spiritual. Right. And um, let's begin. So Matthew 22, that's the parable of the wedding garment. And before we delve into the parable itself, I'd like us to identify its, its setting, its historic context um, within Christ's ministry, right? When we look at Christ's ministry, he ministered for three and a half years. But his ministry um, covered how many Passovers? Four Passovers, yes? He was baptized in 27 AD in the fall. And we see shortly after that the first Passover. Then there's a second Passover, a third. I have one too many. Fourth. And at the fourth Passover, that's where you mark the cross. Oh, sorry. Let me do that again. I was right the first time. So we have his baptism, which is followed by the first Passover, the second, the third, and then the fourth. When we look at Christ's ministry, we also see that um, they are corresponding with the four Passovers are four distinct phases of his ministry that we can identify. Right. This phase is referred to as his early ministry. <coughs> Which was followed by what? Do we know? His uh, Judean ministry, he went to the Jews first. To Jerusalem, to the Jews and to the temple. Did they receive him? No. Then he went to where? To Galilee. He has his Galilean ministry. And what was the condition of the Galileans. They were not as prejudiced as the, as, the, as the Jews that he was dealing with in the Judean ministry. So he found here a more favorable field for his work. It's during his Galilean ministry also that he began speaking in parables. And the final phase of his ministry is referred to as the Perean ministry. He ministered in, in the land of Perea, and it's here where he spoke many of his parables. Now, when we look at the parable that we are dealing with, the parable of um, Matthew 22, 
it's located here within his prayer and ministry. His prayer and ministry was really um, the binding off, you could say, of his, of his uh, personal ministration. And he, he began to make his way to, um, to Jerusalem, where he was, uh, of course, finally uh, crucified. I want us to read Desire of Ages, page 495. Desire of Ages, page 495, as it locates this parable within the closing phase of Christ's ministry. So here, Christ's earthly ministry is coming to a close. And before he goes to the cross, he's giving his final, his final warnings to the Jews in the parables that he, that he presented them in Matthew 22. So when we read Desire for Ages, page 495, beginning from paragraph 1, just read paragraphs 1 and 2 says, the true witness says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Every warning, reproof, and entreaty in the word of God or through his messengers is a knock at the door of the heart. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. With every knock unheeded, the disposition to open becomes weaker. The impressions of the Holy Spirit, if disregarded today, will not be as strong tomorrow. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into a perilous unconsciousness of the shortness of life and of the great eternity beyond. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have been in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven-sent opportunities for learning what is truth. Full of instruction were the lessons which Christ taught as he slowly made his way from Galilee toward Jerusalem. Eagerly, eagerly the people listened to his words. In Perea, as in Galilee, the people were less under the control of Jewish bigotry than in Judea, and his teaching found a response in their hearts. During these last months of his ministry, many of Christ's parables were spoken. The priests and rabbis pursued him with ever-increasing bitterness, and his warnings to them he veiled in symbols. They could not mistake his meaning, Yet they could find in his words nothing on which to ground an accusation against him. In the par parable of the Pharisee and the publican, the self-sufficient prayer, God, I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, stood out in sharp contrast to the penitent's plea, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thus Christ rebuked the hypocrisy of the Jews, and under the figures of the barren fig tree and the great supper, he foretold the doom about to fall upon the impenitent nation. Those who had scornfully rejected the invitation to the gospel feast heard his warning words, I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So we see here Christ, he's approaching uh, the cross, he's approaching the close of his earthly ministry, and he's giving his final warnings to those who were rejecting um, the invitation to the gospel feast. And uh, among these warnings in Matthew 22, three parables are, are identified. And the, although he spoke in parables, they understood him, right? They understood, he says they could not mistake his meaning. But because they were spoken in parables, um, you know, there was nothing in them that they could grasp upon to, 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 to build a case against, to solidify their, their case against him. So that is the... The, then, of course, he's crucified in the spring. And this is uh, 31 AD. So the setting, shall we say, of, and of course you can flesh out this picture further. I'd have liked to, but this study for me is a, is a work in progress. I'm just sharing what I have so far. Um, and what's been, I guess, shared with me in terms of what this parable is teaching. Now, this is the setting, the, the setting of the, of the parable. Christ is approaching the close of his ministry, and he's giving his final warning message to the Jews and their leaders. 
Now, as we uh, go to Matthew 22, if we look at the immediate context of the passage itself, um, it, this is taking place after the second temple cleansing. In Matthew 21, verse 12, the chief priests and elders were asking by what authority he did this work, right, of cleansing the temple. And he begins to respond to them, and that response carries on into Matthew 22. And um, Christ spoke three parables against them, the parable of the disobedient servant, which we find in Matthew 21, 28 to 31, the parable of the vineyard, Matthew 21, 33 to 46, and then the parable of the wedding garment, which begins in, in chapter 22. Right, so as we read, as we begin with the parable, as we read verses 1 and 2, it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Matthew 22, verses 1 and 2. Sorry, I, I left out verse 1. It says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain man, which made a marriage for his son. Right, so what do we see? Um, there's a king, and he's called a wedding for his son. We're looking at the natural before we seek to identify the, the spiritual. Now, this is a wedding. This is a wedding that is being made um, for a son, for a bridegroom, right? So when you look at the natural, how do weddings take place? There's no bride mentioned in the parable, but we know based on the natural that the bride is there, right? Even if she isn't mentioned. Right, so um, there is a king who makes a marriage for his son, and by virtue of the fact that there is a marriage, we know that there is a, there is a bride as well. And then verse 3 says, And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now, when you look at weddings in the natural, who does one invite? One invites family, one invites friends. Right, people with whom they have a connection, right, right. So whoever those that were bidden represent, we know that they have a, a close connection with, with the king. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been invited, right. So, um, and he sent forth his servants to call that, them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come, right. So those that were bidden. These people who have a close connection with the king, they reject the call. Now we read verse 4. It says, Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So we see that the king gives a second invitation. But during this second invitation, uh, he... he, he, he he augments his initial invitation. He adds more to, 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 uh, to communicate to those that were bidden the importance of this wedding and the importance of, his, of their coming, given that he's already made preparation for them. So there's a first call to those who are bidden, and then the second call is more extensive than the first one. Then we read in... Um, Verses 5 and 6. How do those that were bidden respond? It says, But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the, re and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So we see that they neglected. Their response was twofold. You know, uh, insulting neglect on one hand. And some went further to even persecute, right? and kill the servants that were sent. Um, and how did the king respond? Verse 7, 
But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their, their city. Right, so we see uh, the city of the murderers is, is, uh, is destroyed. Right? So we're going, to, we're going through it, then we're going to lay out this line, the line of the natural, right? And then after laying out the line of the natural, we're going to seek to uh, identify its spiritual meaning, okay? Um, verses 8 to 10. The king burnt up the city of the, of the murderers, and he says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So a third call goes out, and now it's not going to those that were bidden. It's not going to those that had a, a close connection with the king. It's now just going to people in the street, right? The highways and byways. So it's going to a different class of people. Just looking at the passage, we can glean that, yes? And, um, and people receive this invitation and they come and now the wedding is furnished with gets. These, these uh, um, I'll use the expression strangers essentially, these people off the street, they receive the call and then they come to the wedding. And the wedding is now furnished with guests. Verse 11 says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which, nad, which had not a wedding garment. What is the implication of this passage? Well, um, it's, it, it's conveying the idea that when the king comes in, he does a work of investigation, right? There was evidently a requirement to have this garment on in order to be fit for, for the wedding, right? In, 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 in some uh, cultures and in the culture of Eastern weddings, a, one could, um, or rather at weddings, there's certain attire that one had to, to wear. Like even in our day, in Western culture, you don't come to a wedding in your commoners dress. There's, there's wedding attire that one must wear as a sign of respect to those who had, who had um, uh, called the wedding. So it says, so it says, so the king comes in, he does a work of investigation to see who has made special preparation by wearing the, the garment, the wedding garment that was required as a sign of respect to, to the king. And he finds there a man without a wedding garment. Um, read verses 12 and 13, it says, And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So after this work of investigating to see who has put on the special garment for the wedding, he finds a man who who hasn't done that work, who hasn't put on the garment. And what happens? He's bound hand and foot and, and uh, cast out, right? Um, so subsequent to that, of course, it's not brought to view, but we understand that the wedding would then have taken place. Once the wedding was finished with guests, the guests have made preparation, then the wedding, then the wedding happens, right? Even though that portion is not explicitly stated in the passage, we can deduce that from, from what we understand about how, how, how wedding ceremonies go. So what have we seen so far? We see a first call. Right? 
And who is this first call going to? Uh, those that were bidden. And those that were bidden had a close connection with the king, right? Okay. Beg your pardon? Those that were bidden had a close connection with the king because when you invite guests to a wedding, you're inviting close family and friends. They reject it. So the king sends out a second call. I'm hearing someone saying first and second angel. I, 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 we'll see about that. <laughs> okay, so first call, second call. Um, and those that were bidden, how do they respond? They reject. And persecute. They kill the servants. And this second call, it was more uh, solicitous than the first. Right, so we have a first call, a second call. And because these calls have been rejected, what does the king determine to do? Mm -hmm. So say city destroyed. The city of the those that were bidden is destroyed, right? And from there, what does he do? He gives a third call. There is a third call that is given. But this third call is going to a different class, right? It's going to the, I'll say H and B, highways and byways. The wedding is then furnished with guests. Then the king comes in and does what? A work of investigation to see who has on the wedding garment. He finds a man who um, has not the wedding garment and we see that uh, judgment is executed. He is bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness. Following the execution of the judgment, we have inferred, based on the natural, that the ceremony finally takes place. Okay, so this is the natural. And we see that in the natural we're presented with a model. A model that we're going to use, that we're going to now identify a, a primary application for. All right, so having identified the natural, we're now going to identify the, the spiritual. And we see that the natural illustrates um, the spiritual. So when we look at the king, right, we're going to say that the king represents God, God the Father, and the son is the son of the king. 
So that, that is Christ. Now, the, the bride is not even... Let me write it here. So we have a king. This is God. There is the Son. This is Christ. And the, the, the bride is, is not even uh, mentioned, let alone... Is, is not mentioned at all. So, we know from the natural that the bride is there, but in order to identify who the bride is, we're going to have to go elsewhere. And I'll ask us to turn to Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9. Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9. We see a marriage being brought to view here. And it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Who is the Lamb? The Lamb is Christ, who is the Son. And his wife hath made herself ready. So here the bride is brought to view. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here we have this marriage scene, but we also have, but we see in the last portion that we read, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see that in this marriage scene in heaven, they're guests as well, right? So we have a bride, we have guests. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Right? So, um, Matthew 19, or Revelation 19, uh, gives us this picture of the, the marriage of the, of the Lamb. We see, we see a bride, we see guests, but Revelation 21 verse 2 tells us specifically who the, ma who the bride is. Revelation 21 verse 2, it says, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the bride is New Jerusalem. And the guests are those who are present in heaven at the marriage ceremony. I'll say these are the saints. God's people. So in the spiritual application that we are making, those are the actors that we've identified so far. Or rather, uh, let me put down what I have in my notes. We'll say that the guests are the people. Right? The guests are the people. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we see taking place in the natural? We see a first call and a second call being given. It went to those that were bidden. We said those that have a close connection to the king. So the natural illustrates the spiritual. The spiritual must follow the same rule, right? Who were those who had a, a close connection to the king? if we locate this passage within its historic context, and its historic context is where? Here in Christ's prayer and ministry, just before he went to the cross. Who are those who had a close connection to the king? The Jews, right? So if you look at Christ's object lessons, page 308. Uh, Christ's object lessons, page 308. Uh, this is communicated. I'm going to draw another line. We have this natural, and now I want to identify the spiritual. Wish I had left more space for this one. 
So Christ's Object Lessons, page 308, says, <clears throat> The call to the feast had been given by Christ's disciples. Our Lord had sent out the twelve, and afterward the seventy, proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand, and calling upon men to repent and believe the gospel. But the call was not heeded. Those who are bidden to the feast did not come. The servants were sent out later to say, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. This was the message borne to the Jewish nation after the crucifixion of Christ, but the nation that claimed to be God's peculiar people rejected the gospel brought to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many did this in the most scornful manner. Others were so exasperated by the offer of salvation, the offer of pardon for rejecting the Lord of glory, that they turned upon the bearers of the message. There was a great persecution. Many, both men and women, were thrust into prison, and some of the Lord's messengers, as Stephen and James, were put to death. So we see here uh, two calls are given. The first call those that were bidden, those that had a close connection to the king, within the context of where Christ is standing, were the Jews. So the Jews are those that were, those that were bidden. And they reject the first call. And the first call, it said, was, was what? The ministry of the, the twelve and the seventy. This first call is, is rejected, and he sends a second call. And what is the second call? Did this passage say? Or is it further ahead of my notes? Yeah, she does say, um, this was the message born to the disciples, born after the crucifixion of Christ. So this is 31 AD, right? And when we look at this second call, it, it was more solicitous than the first. There was more to it. It had more power. What happened in 31 AD that answers to, to this aspect of the first, second call? Pentecost, yes. So we have this second call. We have Pentecost. It's, it's a repetition of the first call, but it has more, more power. It's more solicitous than the first. But what did the Jews do? They persecute and kill the servants. And she gives the example of Stephen and James, who especially gave up their lives uh, in this time period. So, what does the king then determine to do? He determines to destroy their city. I also want us to see uh, this parallel that um, the first and second calls cover the time period brought to view in Daniel, um, in Daniel 9, 27 to 29, right? We have 27 AD, then we have uh, 31 AD, which is the cross. And on say it ends in 34 AD. All right, so we have the first call, the second call, and then the city is burned. When is the city burned? 70 AD. 70 AD. 
So I want us to identify the third core. And in order to, to see this, I will read Christ in his sanctuary, page 88. Christ in his sanctuary, page, page 88. C-I-H-S, page 88. And it says, <clears throat> The 70 weeks or 490 years were to pertain especially to the Jews. At the expiration of this period, the nation sealed its rejection of Christ by the persecution of his disciples, and the apostles turned to the Gentiles, 34 AD. The first 490 years of the 2300 having then ended, 810 years would remain. From 34 AD, 810 years extend to 1844. Then said the angel, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All the preceding specifications of the prophecy had been unquestionably fulfilled at the time appointed. So when we look at the 2300 days, we see that it can be divided into two. There is a portion specifically for, for the Jews. And this came to an end in 34 AD. This is the 490 years. This portion specifically for the Jews. And we then have, it says, 1,810 years. And I'm saying this answers to, to the third call. This third call went to the highways and byways. From 34 AD, add 1,810, it takes you to 1844. And in this time period, who was the third call going to? It was going to a completely different class from those who were bidden. Right? It's going to the, to the Gentiles. Right? From 34 AD to uh, 1844. <coughs> so here the wedding is furnished with guests. And when the wedding is furnished with guests... What does the king do before the wedding? It's a work of investigation. <clears throat> and I'm going to read... Christ in his sanctuary, page 122. It says, <clears throat> At the time appointed for the judgment, the close of the 2300 year, days, in 1844 began the work of investigation and blotting out of sins. All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So immediately at the end of, of uh, the 1,810 years, 1844, the work of investigation starts. And just like the parable, who is investigated in the parable? Those who had accepted the invitation, right, to the wedding. Who is investigated in the judgment that began in 1844? The past told us those who had professed to be servants of God. Do you see the parallel? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> when does this work of investigation come to an end? So I didn't leave myself very much space, but we'll, we'll work with what we have. I'm going to read Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page 428. GC 428. 428. 
Great Controversy, page 428. It says, <clears throat> we're looking to identify when the investigation comes to an end. In the parable of Matthew 22, the same figure of the marriage is introduced and the investigative judgment is clearly represented as taking place before the marriage. Previous to the wedding, the king comes in to see the guests to see if all are attired in the wedding garment, the spotless robe of character washed and made white in the blood of the lamb. He who is found wanting is cast out, but all who upon examination are seen to have the wedding garment are accepted of God and accounted worthy of a share in his kingdom and a seat upon his throne. This work of, examina of examination of character, of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God, is that of the investigative judgment, the closing work of the sanctuary above. When the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of all, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then and not till then, probation will close, and the door of mercy will be shut. Thus, in the one short sentence, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Were carried down to this, through the Savior's final ministration to the time when the great work of man's salvation shall be completed. So in the natural, immediately after the work of investigation, execution followed. Um, all right, sorry, before I come to that. So the investigation ends at the close of probation. When the work of intercession for, for man is done, right? The investigative judgment ends at the close of probation. And immediately following the investigation, we have judgment being executed. And the judgment is the seven last plagues. Exec judgment is executed upon those who are found uh, not to be worthy, right? And then follows the wedding. And when is the wedding? Hmm? What? Uh, yes, sorry, you're right, you're right. Seven plagues. Then we have the wedding. And when is that? Second coming. So, so what we've seen in terms of this parable is that we identified the, the natural model, the natural line, and the natural has illustrated the spiritual, and we see that what Christ was presenting uh, the Jews with was really in its primary application, right, is a, a parable about the entire history of salvation, the close of probation on the Jewish nation, the message going to the Gentiles, the investigative judgment, and the, finally the, the ex execution of judgment and, and the um, wedding at his second coming. Now, there is a, another application, I'll say a local application, which pertained specifically to the Jews, right? This is a macro or, or primary application, but we can identify a local application that dealt w where we see this parable fulfilled within the history of the Jews specifically, right? So I just want to put that on, on the record. 
myself. I didn't do this very well, did I? Okay. So I'll call this a fractal or a local application. The first call went out to the Jews, as we've identified in 27 AD. This is the first call, which was rejected, right? Then the second call went out in 31 AD, which call was also rejected. Then we come to 34. AD, which is the end of probationary time for the Jews. And we see there a third call. Drawing a blank here. All right, let me. One, two, three. I'll just fill in the gaps. All right, that within this local application, the execution of the judgment is 70 AD. All right, this is when judgment is executed. And the wedding, when Christ comes, is at Patmos. Here, John receives visions from Christ, and he receives the vision of the wedding uh, that we read in Matthew 19 and in Matthew uh, 21. Revelation 8, 19 and Revelation uh, 21 is Patmos. So the investigation I want to suggest is 66 AD. What do we see happening in 66? We see, we see the armies of um, Cestius, right? And we see the warning that, that Christ gave. We see the Christians being tested by the warning Christ had given. Right? So there you see you see a, 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 a test, a demonstration of who really had received Christ and who hadn't. That was made manifest by whether they heeded the message or no. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Right? So I want to suggest that AD 66 answers to the investigation. And um, whether you were righteous or not was determined by whether you left the city or no, whether you acted and demonstrated a belief in the messages that, um, that God had sent. And of course, the execution is here. So, um, we do not see, what don't we see? We don't see something answering to the destruction of the city. Right? And we know based on the model that there is something we can identify as a third core. I think we can be, we're certain the structure is correct as we've seen it in both the natural and the spiritual. As I said, this study is a work in progress. I'm simply presenting what's been developed so far, and I haven't yet identified what these represent. But we know they're there. 
we know they're there based on the, the structure. We've seen it fulfilled here, and we've seen it fulfilled here. And we see that the sequence and the nature of the events, all the other way marks are in place, right? So um, I think it's just a, a matter of digging. We know that they're, they're, they're hidden at present. It's a matter of digging them out, right? So when we look at this parable, we now have uh, two witnesses, right? We have two witnesses. We have the macro level application and the micro level application. These two witnesses, when understood, right? Once we flesh them out, we've, we've, we've filled in all the gaps. Um, we've understood them in as much detail as we can. These two witnesses provide us with two models that allow us to do what? That allow us to? Establish it, okay, more than that. Apply it to our time. All right, that allows us to make application to our time. But I'm not gonna do that for you. I'm not gonna do that for you. This is as far as as, 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 I've, as I've taken the study. Um, but I, I, I think um, there's enough information here that, uh, you know, if we want to go back and, and, and look at this parable more closely, we certainly can. I think it's very useful. There's a lot to be gleaned from uh, fleshing out the, the setting, the historic context, which locates the parable fleshing out the specifications of the parable, looking into the spirit of prophecy to see what else she, she adds, filling out this line, and then finally making application to, to our time. All I've sought to do in the studies that I've been sharing is to try to give illustrations of you know, what it looks like to, to handle a parable and to try to, to use these principles of application and to try to identify what God's word is teaching, be it one of Christ's parables or be it, as we covered yesterday, a prophetic portion of, of scripture. And uh, because I think with a lot of, uh, we may understand the theory of it and the theory of it has been presented very well, right? The, the, all the details about you know, the, the nature and purpose of parable teaching and the principles that comprise it. But I know where we all struggle is, is, is in operationalizing those things. Right. So I just hope that the exercise has been useful. Um, I pray it's been a blessing. That you've come away with a better idea of how you can go back home and understand God's word for yourself. Right? Dig out the hidden treasure for yourself. So that is it from me. Let's uh, close the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to your feet, Lord. Thank you for your word. We thank you again for the light that you are presently unsealing to your people to prepare them, Lord, for the close of probation and for the next phase um, of the work, um, of the work of the gospel, which is leading to the end of the great controversy. Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath and the opportunity to be here at this camp. Please bless us, Lord, as it is the last day of this camp. Help us to really enjoy, to relish the, the time that we have together and the messages that will be shared. Um, may it please you to pour out your spirit in a manner, Lord, that will confirm us in the things that we've heard. Um, Lord, it's uh, also time for uh, breakfast. We ask that you may bless the food and the hands that have uh, prepared it. Help us to be, to be temperate and uh, help our words to one another uh, to be a savor of life unto life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.